Um, if you wouldn't mind bowing with me one more time just before I speak um, for an extra word of prayer. Our Father and our God in heaven, Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I just want to pray for your words and your spirit to come into this room. Um, again, we ask for the presence of holy angels and for your enlightenment. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The last time um, I was here, I spoke on Mark in the past we were talking about Mark chapter 4. And we were talking about the parable of the sower and the significance of that parable. And as I was praying about what to speak on and what to say today, um, I felt very impressed that we can go in no better order than Jesus himself did. And so just briefly for a moment, I'm going to go back to Mark chapter 4. For those of you who have your Bible, we can all be using my Bible a lot today. And in Mark chapter 4, verse 13 was the premise that I went on last time. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and from time to time I'm reading the King James Version, because I think it has a few words in there that um, bear some importance. But it says in verse 13, and he says to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Now, most of us know this parable, the sower sows the word, and it falls on different types of soil. Some of the um, seed falls on stony ground, some of it falls on thorny ground, some of it falls on good ground, and some of it falls by the wayside. And we discussed last time, and just to briefly review, that each type of soil represents a mindset that we have towards God when He comes to us. So every single type of soil represents ways in which we may be either receptive or non receptive to the things that God has to give us. Um, many, many, including myself at times, have been stunning that we've been studying around here where. We hear the word, and the second something happens, we're kind of done with it. We don't really, we don't really believe in God when it's inconvenient to believe in what he says. Then on the other hand, we have many wayside hearers who, well, I've also been in that position too, where it's, the Lord sends word, the Lord is giving a message to your heart, and we don't really take the time to let it sink in. You don't really take the time, and then he instantly comes and just snatches it away. There's some distraction, there's some uh, problem in life or anything that comes up and it just snatches it out of your heart before you even get a chance to really understand it. And then a lot of people are thorny ground here where, as the Bible says, the weeds grow up and they choke the seed that is grown. So the word comes in, but what happens? Well, we get a little bit too busy <laughs> or we get a little bit too concerned with family issues or emotional issues and everything from life, our desires, our quests in life, they get in the way. They take up more time than God has been told for us to take. And so looking at this parable, Christ ends this parable in, let's see, in verse 21 here. He begins to speak of something else. So in verse 21, Right after this parable, Christ says, and he said unto them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket, or under a bed, and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to life. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And so here we have yet another illustration from Christ, directly following the first one. And what he's trying to explain is, that if we are willing to receive the seed from the first parable here, and we are willing to receive him because we understand that Jesus Christ is the word, and that the seed is also the word. And so if we are willing to receive him, and receive him in his fullness, he is simply saying that there is nothing in his word, there are, nothing, there are no mysteries between us and him. That's not how he desires it to be. He doesn't desire us to be constantly questioning everything about our Christian life, our experience, our growth, how everything works. He wants us to understand. As we understand the book of Psalms, 
In chapter 119, verse 105, he expresses that the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So when Christ here says, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket, he's saying, my word was not given to you to be in it. So the purpose of God in giving us this thing was not so that we could hide it for ourselves either. It was so that we can give it to other people. But most importantly, it is so that God can give it to us. It is open to us. It is open for our study. And I think at times we forget that God is not interested in being away from us. God is not interested in being separated from us. He's not interested in keeping secrets from us. He's interested in having a relationship. And we understand relationships don't happen overnight, but he's interested in developing that relationship and spending time with us so that it can grow. So just following this, he says that the if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. I always found this really interesting. If you, you can find this text in the Old Testament as well, with some the same kind of wording here. And that is that it is up to us to be the ones who hear. God is not hiding things or He is not withholding things from us. It is up to us to be the ones to listen, to open ourselves up to the relationship. You know, many times in my life, I've seen people make mistakes, and I've seen people go astray from God. And even in my own life, I've gone straight from God. And my first thing is, but you know, God still loves me. It's like, absolutely. But it's not your, it's not his love for you that's ever been in question. Right? Christ came and died for us. Of course he loves you. He's proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt. The proof now lies on us to prove that we love him. And so the actions and the works that we do in our life are not as a rule set or a structure. They are to grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they are to show that we love him. Now, on the other hand, we say, you know, we have many problems and they don't seem to go away overnight. And so for this, Jesus had another parable. In verse 26, in verse 26, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed in the ground. And he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. So here we have another parable. And Christ is expecting his apostles to understand this parable, because they understood the first one. So the language is the same. It's still a seed, it's still the ground. We're still talking about the Word of God and we're talking about our hearts. But now he explains how one is transformed into a Christian. Now, between the Apostle Paul and Christ and many people in the New Testament, we will find that growth in the physical realm of both plants and animals is very similar and comparable to growth in the spiritual realm. And this is why Christ used the language. Because, as he said, Spiritual, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So, for the majority of us, the majority of us who had yet to have heard the word, those of us who had not experienced the Holy Spirit, looking at this, he is trying to express it in terms that we can understand, in terms of the natural, in terms of what we can physically and tangibly see and feel. Because it's easier in that respect to actually get an understanding of the spiritual world, how we grow in Christ, and how our life is to be like His. But one question for the week is, if a seed is planted, does another type of plant grow? If I plant an apple seed, will I not grow an apple tree? Or if I plant a peach seed, will I not grow a peach tree? You know, a lot of times, I myself have questioned the legitimacy of my relationship with Christ and worried, and, and then on and off because of what is showing up in my life, the different, the different aspects, the characteristics, the traits, the habits. But here's the truth. The truth is, in this text, God only gave us really one word, and that was to be receptive. Because the seed will produce of itself. The Bible says here, 
that the person who planted the seed does not know how it grows. So when we're looking to ourselves in our spiritual life, we often hurt ourselves in many ways because we forget to realize that the seed grows of its own accord. If we are receptive, if we are truly good ground, the life that Christ wants for you will grow up. But in some respects, I believe you probably don't really believe that. I know at times I have it. And that results in that being the ground. It results in the fruit not showing forth. And so instead of running to God, we become afraid. We fear that God wants to punish us, that God wants to judge us. And oftentimes we mistake the voice of judgment and the voice of guilt for the voice of God. As we go from day to day, we make a mistake and we beat ourselves half to death for it. But in reality, is that the voice of God? No. Jesus Christ said that another comforter would come. He said that the Holy Spirit was a comforter. And when he said another, he was implying that he himself was a comforter. Now, at times I understand many of the things he said, you know, calling people snakes and white sepulchers and so on and so forth might not exactly sound like comfort. But this is who he said he was. And I don't think we often, we oftentimes don't really understand that. It's easier, again, to compare the relationship of a parent and a child to the relationship with Christ and us. And the reason why it's so simple and so easy is because quite often I think that we take God's parenting as him not loving us. Quite often the situations and circumstances that God is allowing for our benefit, for our good, for our growth, we take these things and we misconstrue them. Not of our own accord, we understand that there is an enemy who has the highest desire of doing these things. However, the Christian life should be a life of faith. It should be a life of that allows us to trust God as our Father. You know, a lot of times it's interesting, I've always thought about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, a lot of times we think of our Heavenly Father as being the kind of overlord, right? In one of the King James verses, it says that we consider Him to be austere, right? Harsh, critical, kind of overbearing, doesn't have a smile. And we forget that it is not the Father who judges us. The Bible says that Jesus is the one who has been given authority to judge us. We also forget that when we look at the life of Christ, he said that he did no works of his own, but that the works he did came from his Father. And so oftentimes I think we forget that the Holy Spirit also reflects Jesus Christ. He said that he who said would tell you of me. <clears throat> So a lot of times we insert him. We say, man, I wish I could just have a conversation with Jesus today. I wish I could have sat there and heard his words. Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit is sitting there, and he's <laughs> in the corner almost chuckling, going, what, what, what am I? What do you think of me? You know, we read these texts, and very often we've been critical. We hear the words, uh, grieve the Holy Spirit. And we think, you know, unpardonable sin. We're going, this, this is where we're going. You know, there's heaven and there's hell. If you grieve the Holy Spirit, then we know where we're going. But the problem with that is that you can't grieve someone that does not care about you. You know, I once heard the minister say that. He said, grieve is a love term. The Holy Spirit wants to draw near. He wants to be with you. He wants to be in you. And so this parable, though it looks simple on its face, is possibly one of the hardest lessons for the Christian to learn. Because the lesson here is very clearly it says he knows not how. You don't, you won't know. And you may not always see the fruit of a Christian life. Not immediately. It takes time for a plant to grow. But if we remain receptive to the word of God, if we remain receptive, we know that the seed will grow. Now in the King James version of this text, at the very end there's a Slight difference, verse 29. It says, But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. 
And I like the King James Version for several reasons. But the word fruit is particularly easy to follow through the King James Version of the Bible. It is the same word throughout the New Testament, but in new translations, we translate it to make more sense. We say wheat, or we say uh, grain, or we say corn, or whatever. But he says fruit here. And the reason why I think that is key is because that same word is used all throughout the New Testament to describe the righteousness and the characteristics that God desires from Christians. Another reason I think we are somewhat afraid to look at God sometimes is because we have set our standards in His place. We have our own ideas of what righteousness is. Maybe we grew up with them. Maybe we were taught them. Or maybe we just put them in our own head. And I've seen all three of those, and I've experienced all three of those. <laughs> so I'm not being condemning when I say this. But none of us know God's real ideals for us. None of us know His real law. How can I say this? Because Christ came as the living example of the law. And until I see someone who resembles Christ perfectly, I can't say that any of us really understand the law. It is he who represents righteousness in its fullest extent, and not us. I think we fail to realize that even if we reach the standard that we have set, only Christ can atone for the time that we did not reach that standard. Only Christ can ever make up for our deficiencies. And the standard we see, even the good standard, will only ever be in part. Which is partially why Paul says, now I see in part. Right? He says, my knowledge will pass away, my understanding is going to go away at some point. All the prophecies that I understand, they're only in part, they only partially tell me what's going on. The only thing that abided with him was his love for Jesus Christ and his love for his fellow man as a result of that. And so talking about the outgrowth here, again, it says it is fruit. And so I'm going to go to Galatians really quickly. I'm trying to get there as quickly as I can. Galatians, and I'm going to go to chapter 5 and verse 22 here. And most of us are familiar with this text, I presume. It says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there, are no, there is no law. And the King James Version has a couple of differences in wording. So it says, Temperance, which it tells a bit more than self-control. And many times people apply temperance only to the body, to what we eat, and what we drink, and these types of things. But temperance in the Old English here, as it is translated, it covers a lot more than that. It has to do with balancing every aspect of life. These are the fruits that grow out of a Christian life. And these fruits do not grow by us trying. Again, the text said you don't know how they're going to grow. We don't know how these things are going to develop in our life. We merely have to trust in Christ. We have to have faith that He is doing that work. And we have to remain open for the seed to find good ground in us. And so often I find in myself fear. One day God told me that I was about to do something for him, simply because I feared not doing it, God said, well, what's the point? If you're doing it out of fear, you may as well not do it at all. God has no desire to have a fearful relationship with you. I mean, it's really kind of odd how we view the character of God in these respects. God is trying to have a relationship with us. And a relationship involves sacrifice on both ends. Christ sacrificed his life. The sacrifice for us is what? It's honestly trust. It's honestly sacrificing our own system of control. You know, I was talking to someone this week and we came across the topic of control over our lives and our circumstances. And I was saying that it's really an illusion 
that we have control over anything. And we convince ourselves daily that we have control over things. And as long as we sit there in that control, we feel comfortable. We feel, okay, we have control over this, I'm okay. But in reality, do we really have control over anything? Do we really have control over our lives? Over the lives of our loved ones? Over our relationships? Control is an illusion. Only God has control over everything. And so, in honesty, when we don't trust God, what is it that we are really doing? See, the topic that I said that I would speak on today is reliance on God. The topic I'm talking about is Christian growth. But I think too often we separate those two things. Because there is no Christian growth if there is no reliance on God. You know, a lot of times I've seen people organize their lives and get every habit that they believe to be wrong in line and in order. And a lot of times the same people who can do this are very apt to be pushy and they're apt to be condemnatory on other people. They're apt to just bring down the other hand on people who don't act like them. And in reality, just like the Pharisees and Sadducees in the time of Christ, they have set up a standard of righteousness for themselves. Christianity requires divinity. If there is no divine action in the life, then what is the point of being a Christian? If Jesus Christ is not real to us, if there's no communication, if God is just silent, then do we believe the same thing as the people outside of these walls? If God does nothing for us, and there are quite a few people who will tell you, many, many atheists will say, Christianity has great principles that will help you out in your life. It's the principles upon which we build, upon which we build Western society and all these other things. And yet there's quite a few flaws <laughs> with our society. But in reality, the truth is, true Christianity is a work of faith. And faith has to grow. You know, in the book of John, we go to chapter 15 of John. The book of says, okay, there's another text about growth here. Christ gives a slightly different illustration. And again, I don't think we can do much better than the words of Christ when it comes to illustrating how the Christian life should work. John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, and it may bear more fruit. And here we have the concept, a, mo- a few different concepts here. Again, you could go for hours on these, just from these parables. You could go in different directions. You could talk about growth. You could talk about what the seed is. And you would find that these concepts are tied all throughout the Bible. God was giving, through Jesus Christ, God has, was giving everything that he has stored up for thousands of years at this point. And he was giving it all in short sentences. But here he says a few interesting things. First off, he says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. What does this mean? This means that you may not see all of the fruits of a Christian life in one day. This means that there may be times where you have to go through some difficult situations so that God can produce more of these traits. When we read the fruit of the Spirit, we seldom get uncomfortable, but I think many of us maybe should. That discomfort should send us to a reliance on God. It should send us to Him, to trust in Him. Again, this text says, He proves that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. That's an interesting phrase. Someone, 
I can't even remember who, but someone got up here a number of weeks ago and he preached about this text. He spoke about this text, John 15. Does that sound like the words of someone who's trying to condemn you? Does it sound like the words of someone who's willing to cast you out? I know a lot of black people will go straight to that, that part of the text. Every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he throws it out. <laughs> well, why do you think? It's because it's not abiding, it's not because it's not bearing fruit. The fruit is a symptom of growth. Very often time again, we, we look to ourselves for this growth, but we really need to be looking to our connection to Christ. Because our growth we can't control. We can only control the one aspect. We are the soil. We can control that one thing. And in this sense, we can control only the abiding. And so the question is, how hard is it for us to spend time with Christ? You know, a lot of us, I think, think we're going to get into heaven by our works, or maybe by the little good that we have in us, or by, we just think we're going to slide by some way. But in all reality, there's only one way we're going to get to heaven, and that is by knowing Christ and by loving Christ. You see, it is his father's house that we are going to, and I know of no good father who would allow someone into his home who hated his son. And so it is our love for him. It is our love for him that is in question. It is our love for him that will show in the end whether or not he knows us, whether or not he will receive us. We're talking about the most compassionate and loving God. If you've ever heard some of the stories of the other gods, <laughs> you'll understand what I mean. If you look at the old South American culture and you look at the old uh, Incan and Mayan cultures, you will see their gods were not exactly kind. The sacrifice of children was common. Human sacrifice and blood ritual were very common in many religions across the globe. The ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans did all sorts of vile things in the ceremonies to their gods. There's only one God who says, look, all I want is a relationship with you. And sometimes, sometimes we need to realize that God is knocking. You know, the book of Revelation, he's sitting there knocking at the door of our hearts. A lot of times we've read the text to the lay of the scenes. It says, you are poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. And we say, well, that's just great. But what is he really saying? See, it's not a full stop at the end of that. He said, I counsel you to buy from these things. If you read the other chapters in the Bible, you'll find that it is without money, without price, that you gain these things. Christ is a rich man trying to offer us the things that we have need of. He says, you're poor, take my coat. You're blind, take eyes out. Each need that we have, he is there to supply. It is our job to be receptive. And it's the most difficult job you can have. Trusting God with every aspect of your life, through the difficulties and through the good times. You know, sometimes it's harder. Well, not sometimes, but most of the time it's harder to trust God in the good times than it is in the bad. And sometimes we think, why is God allowing me to have a good time? But maybe he just wants to have a conversation with you. Maybe he hasn't talked to you in a few weeks. Maybe he hasn't talked to you in a month. Maybe he wants you to just see that you need him. You know, the book Desire of Ages, I don't want to have an interesting thing to say about Peter when he was walking in the water with Christ. She said that Peter felt his need for Christ on the water, but he never felt the need for him when he was walking on the dry land. He never realized that he had an equal need in both senses. Christianity as it is so titled, is the religion of Christ. And what is Christianity in a Christless heart? What is Christianity if there is no Christ, if there is no love of God, if there is no relationship with God? Is Christianity even a thing? As we behold Christ, as we abide in Him, 
we will find <clears throat> that we will see fruit. We will find that we will see all these things. The affirmation of our faith today was up in Psalms 4. Turn the go to it. Not the affirmation of faith, I'm sorry. It's called something different at this church. <laughs> It's in Psalms chapter 4. I'm going to read that really briefly. I'm going to read the last couple of verses here. Verse 5 says, Offer right sacrifices. And the King James says, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Does there be many that say, Who will show us any good? Is that us? I think even those who have been in this life sometimes question that. Because emotionally, maybe it's not so good. Maybe we're going through mental turmoil, maybe we're going through situations. And we say, Who is going to fix this? When am I going to have peace? And I like the way the King James puts this here. It says, God has put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increase. He said, I am gladder now by just trusting in you than in the time when you gave them the things that they were asking for. When you gave them your promise. The last verse, David knew where his safety was. There's actually a story in closing now. There's actually a story where David is being chased for his life and he's in the mountains and hills of Hekaila. And he's on one side of the mountain and on the other side of the mountain just a short distance from him is the man who wants to kill him and is the king and all his army. And so his general comes to him and says, what are we going to do about this? And his response is something very much like verse 8 here. I will both lay him down in peace and sleep, for thou, O Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. See, David, he knew. From years of experience, David knew that he had no control over what Saul was going to do. He had no control over what would happen tomorrow. And so he said, I'm going to sleep. God is the one who controls it anyway. We all know the story of David. He lived. A long life, the king, king, so on and so forth. It's trust that does that. The last text here, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a chapter that everyone should be accustomed to. Everyone should have heard it multiple times. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or kingdom symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains and have not charity, I am not. Interesting the order that we put these things in our head. I've heard many people say, Man, I wish I had the faith to move a mountain. Do we wish that we had charity, not just towards each other, but towards God? That we would give God the benefit of the doubt sometimes. Maybe sometimes we see where God is taking us. We see troubles coming. We see all these different problems and situations. And maybe sometimes we give God the benefit of the doubt as our Father and say, well, He knows what's about to happen. Charity. It says, and though I bestow all my gifts to feed the poor, and though I gave my body to be burned, and have my charity, it profits me nothing. There's nothing gained from any of these things. Even a martyr at the stake, it says here, if he has not charity, there is no love in his heart. I remember charity is the outgrowth of trust in Christ. It is the outgrowth of this Christian life we've been talking about this whole time. It's something that happens to you. Remember, there's a God in our, in our religion. There's a God who comes in and he acts. Divine intervention acts on behalf of the Christian. 
It is a miracle when we are saved. It is a miracle that Christ comes in and changes the life. It is not, uh, it's not a simple act. In the Jesus text now. Charity suffers long and is kind. In the ESV it says love is patient and kind. But I think we often forget that patience oftentimes means suffering. Oftentimes it means suffering for a long time. So I like the old English in that sense because being long suffering or suffering along and being patient are similar. But what implies how we actually feel when we have to be patient? We all know this. When it comes time to be patient, it's difficult. It's painful. Charity does not envy. Charity does not boast and is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seek it not her own. It's not easily provoked. And get no evil. See, when we think of love, I'm not sure we think of these things. Because this is the love of God towards us, too. Like when God is doing something for your life, He is not seeking His own. He is seeking what is best for you. We merely trust it because it is the will of God. But in reality, the will of God would be your will if you had His knowledge. Rejoice is not in liberty, but rejoice is in the truth. Bear is all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Even our knowledge of what is current, our knowledge of everything, our knowledge of God even includes here, because it's his prophecy. I know many people who believe that because they understand all the prophecies and all the, that it's going to mean something. But when Christ called the sheep and the goats, he said, where were you when I was in prison? He said, where were you when the poor were around? When you didn't visit them, you didn't visit me. He was saying, do you love me? And if you don't, then I never knew you. See, so, yeah, his standard is different than ours. If we read through some of the parables, you will find that. You'll find sometimes it seems unfair because of our own perspectives. You'll find the parable of the man who paid men to work for a day, and at the end of the day, there were some more men who wanted to come by, and he paid them too. The same amount. Wouldn't that be great? You work all day and someone comes around and they get the same opinion as you for working out. But why is it fair? Because it was God's to give. He's illustrating his story. We are all undeserving. None of them were owed anything except what he promised them. It was his money to give. And it's his grace to give to us. Sometimes I think we feel when we're with certain people like they are undeserving of the grace of God. And that's a huge problem on our behalf.